is doing. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life and not only so but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement I want to stop at verse 11 let's read verse 11 again in English and not only so but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement in Spanish y no solo esto sino que también nos gloriamos en Dios por el Señor nuestro Jesucristo por quien hemos recibido ahora la reconciliación I want to talk to you on this subject this evening I want to teach on peace with God a lot of people talk about the peace of God but there's a difference between the peace of God and peace with God and that's what I want to talk about the peace with God <clears throat> peace with God. Can we lift up our hands and let's ask God to speak to us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Lord, people have traveled from their homes, come from different distances to just come and worship you and come to encounter you. I want you to honor their hunger and their desire for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Can you clap your hands as you're being seated? Amen. Peace with God. We have journeyed through the book of Romans for the past four chapters. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome writing to them, letting them understand that they do have a commonality between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a division, a rift, um, a faction in the church because the church started as a primarily Jewish church. And it started as a primarily Jewish church, but then the Jews were, uh, the Jewish Christians were exiled. And whenever the Jewish Christians were exiled, um, it became a predominantly Gentile church. And the Gentiles just did things a little differently than the Jewish Christians. And then over time, the Jewish Christians began to trickle back into the uh, church. And there was a division uh, because they were fighting over whose background was the best. The Gentiles rejoiced over being saved from paganism, but the Jews felt so privileged and entitled, they said, well, you know, it's really all about keeping the law anyway. And so there was one side emphasizing one part, the other side emphasizing a different part, and Paul is showing them that they all have a commonality, and that is that we all were born in sin. Number one. Number two, we all have a Savior in Jesus Christ. And that, my friend, is the bottom line. Amen? That's the bottom line. 
And he walks with them through this because he shows the grace of God and how it extends to all, but he also shows that the wrath of God is against the ungodly. And we talked about the Greek word for wrath. It means it's not an impulsive anger. It is a deep-seated anger that is, that is constantly brewing slowly. Not a microwave anger, but a, a, a stewing anger. Uh, and I know we say that um, when you let it marinate over time, it's better. Uh, but, uh, hey, man, not with the wrath of God. Amen. And so he walks through this. And last week we talked about how that Abraham is the father of the, the Jews, but he's also the father of the Gentiles because the covenant came in faith. Everyone say in faith. Not through the law, not through man's uh, righteousness or man's ability, but the covenant is in faith. It's in belief because the covenant was in Abraham's belief in God and God gave Abraham righteousness before Abraham was ever circumcised. And so he's saying that righteousness came by faith. It didn't come by the works of the law. And then he said the works of the law, it shows that we are transgressors and that sin is imputed to us because of the law. But he said, but when we have faith that he will give his righteousness unto us, therefore Abraham is the father of the Jews and the Gentiles. He's the father of the Gentiles because he believed in God while he was uncircumcised. A lot of people don't want to talk about this, but the Jewish nation, it was founded by Abraham. But we have to remember before Abraham was declared to be a Jew, he was a Gentile. Amen. But he believed the Lord and God imparted righteousness unto him. And so it says, just as Abraham is our father, and we talked about it last week, that his body being now dead, he was 100 years old, still believing that he would have a child. It caused the deadness of Sarah's womb that she's too old to have a child. He staggered not at the promise of God. He believed that he was faithful who had promised. And God imparted righteousness unto him. Now, he is showing through the book of Romans the, the commonality of faith that, that the Jews and Gentiles have. And he is promoting a deep-seated unity in the congregation. He's an apostle to the Gentiles, but he had yet to visit Rome. Uh, but this epistle is powerful because he's highlighting prominent features of what Jesus Christ accomplished. Now, a lot of people know Jesus died for them, but they don't understand what that means. He died for my sins. What, what, what does that mean? He is laying out what it means. Here it is. It says that, it's like they say in verse 1, it says, therefore. They, they say it this way. If, if you ever see the word therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. And so anytime there's a therefore, you have to go to the preceding scriptures. So what are the preceding scriptures? It says in, in uh, verse 22 of chapter 4, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, what he's saying here is, is that our belief in God, our belief in Jesus makes us the children of Abraham. That just as righteousness was imputed unto him, the Hebrew word for righteousness literally meant God putting his righteousness on Abraham. And so he's saying that when you believe in Jesus, and we talked about it in Romans chapter 1, that in the gospel is the righteousness of God. When you obey the gospel, when you believe in Christ, and you, you let that belief lead you into confession, let that confession lead you into repentance, let that confession 
that repentance lead you into baptism. Let that baptism lead you into the infilling of his spirit. In the gospel is the righteousness of God. And when you walk in the gospel, what happens is all the righteousness that was in that perfect man, Jesus, he doesn't see you as guilty because of your sins. He puts his righteousness upon you and says, all I see is the blood. And in sin, you deserve God's wrath. Amen. But because of the gospel, because of what he did on the cross, because of what him rising again, he died for our offenses, but he rose again for our justification. Justification, it is a legal term. It means God is giving you legal standing. You can stand before him legally with righteousness. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Is that powerful? See, sin comes a penalty. That's another legal term. Penalty. You deserve judgment. Another legal term. Judgment, penalty. That's not good for us. But he says, through Christ, you are justified. That means that because of what he did, when you obey the gospel, when you believe in him, you get to stand before him legally. He cannot Go under his blood and call forth your sin. Come on, somebody. It's already been pardoned. It's already pardoned. It's under his blood. Now, here's what I want to get to in verse 1. Okay. And for those of you that missed those lessons, you know, we have them all archived on YouTube and on Facebook if you'd like to uh, look at that and catch up. But listen to this, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say you have the peace of God. Everyone wants the peace of God. I want the peace of God. I want the peace of God. I want the peace of God. That's wonderful. He gives peace that passes understanding. He says, no, you have peace with God. You know what that means? That means that when people are in sin and sinners, that the wrath of God is against them. Wow. But he made a way to appease his wrath through the sacrifice, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. My goodness, that's exciting. That, that, that I have peace with him because when you're in sin, you're walking contrary to him. What, is it, what does the scripture say? He resists the proud. You know what the resist means? It means he's against you. <laughs> I told someone, I said, listen, listen. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride is literally warfare against God. And he's never lost the battle. <laughs> he's never lost. He will humble you. He wins against the devil and he wins against you. Come on, somebody. If he beheld Satan fall as lightning, pride goes before destruction. So the point is when we're walking in sin, we are walking contrary to him. And we are, we are moving against him and he's, and, he's, and he's pushing against us. You ever tried to go through a door God didn't want you to go through? And by the time you got through that door you wanted to go through, and you came back out of that door, you came back like a bunch of holes, a bunch of patches, got a, got a black eye. And then you say, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I should have obeyed. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You ever say, well, I'm just going to do it, and God's just going to have to deal with it. And then we'd be like, and then when we come out of it, we're like, Lord, you are my father forever. I will. Isn't that the truth? He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We have peace with God because of the sacrifice of Calvary. Because he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, we have peace with him. Meaning, through Jesus, we signed the peace treaty. We're not going to be at war with him no more. 
That's what that is. Later, we're going to talk about it in verse 10. It says that we were the enemies of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be God's enemy. I'm quick to say, you win. <laughs> Peace. I'm not waving the white flag. I'm waving, I'm waving the red flag. I'm waving the blood. <laughs> y'all going, okay, y'all. Let, let's get to that Greek word peace. Can you bring that up here? Uh, um, let's see if we, we have it showing up here. Does it fit? Perfect. Erinne. This is the word peace. To join Tied together into a whole, properly wholeness. That's what peace is. When all essential parts are joined together, peace, God's gift of wholeness. That's what peace is. That's what having peace with God is. That's the Greek word used here for peace. That God it doesn't allow you to stay broken in sin. But he made a way through his blood to make you whole. My, aren't you thankful for peace with God? Without him, I'm going to stumble through this world broken. But with him, I'm going to walk through this world with a wholeness and a peace in me. But it only comes through Jesus. He's, he's the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It only comes through Jesus. You don't get peace with God by any other route but through him. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. You see, I got to break it down for you here because this is, this is profound. He says, listen, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he died, rose, uh, died, was buried, and rose again the third day, because he sent forth his spirit on the day of Pentecost, because of what he has done, we are walking in grace. And we have access to this grace through faith. We have access by faith into this grace. Look at this word access. So let's look at the Greek word for access. Prosagoge. It literally means to come towards. We have access. We're able to come near now. See, I didn't want to be by him while, while he was my enemy. <laughs> see, see, isn't it amazing when we start drifting and sinning? We start trying to get away from him. This is like, God's like, I love you. Like, oh, okay, I love you too. I'm busy sinning. I'm busy sinning. But when you try to live right, you're just like, God, where are you? I love you. I love you. Isn't that the truth? When you're the, his enemy, it's different. And Someone had a funny quote. I got to say this. I didn't want to say this. I got to say this funny quote. It's a funny quote because it kind of gives credence to this doesn't apply. This quote does not apply to anybody here. Everybody say amen. amen. This quote does not apply to anybody here. I got to give a waiver. <laughs> got to give a disclaimer. Amen. Sign the paper before you leave. Amen. This isn't for anybody here, but this is a funny quote. Because, but it does symbolize what happens when we become the enemies of God. When we are walking in sin, we don't want to approach him. Isn't this the truth? When you know you mess up, you just kind of want to hide a little bit. Right? So, so what, one, what one person said, and remember, this doesn't apply to anybody here. I got to say that for the third time. He said, <laughs> he said, saints meaning people in the church, he said, saints are kind of like automobiles. They start missing before they quit. That, that's not for you. Why, why it's so quiet? Y'all supposed to laugh. That's a, that's a funny, that's funny. Okay, all right. If I need to explain the Greek to that later, let me know. Let me know. <laughs> But we have access. You don't have to run away from him. 
You hear? You don't have to run away from him. But through Jesus Christ, you have access. Guess what? Guess what? If you had access to him before you, before, if God knew who you were before you met him, and he didn't judge you before you believed in him, come on. There is enough grace, long suffering, and patience for you to come boldly to the throne of grace where we can find help. In the time of need. So it means to come near. To have access. To approach. Here it is. With intimate face-to-face interaction. What, what, what type of God we serve that's a king that allows us to come close? Listen, I was in Paris. And I went to King Louis' palace of Versailles. Hey. I was there, y'all. The, the Hall of Mirrors. Y'all not hearing me out there. Beautiful, beautiful place. The whole palace, like, made out of gold. Y'all not hearing me. It's crazy to just see gold on the palace. That's, I ain't never seen gold before. So to just see the whole palace covered in gold, I'm like, my. I didn't want to touch it. I just. When we were at the Louvre in the museum, Louisa was about to touch a painting. There was this painting, like it was like from the 1600s, and she started doing her hands. I said, girl, don't touch that. <laughs> they don't touch that, baby girl. And, you know, I'm like, the, like, like the, the oils from your fingers, it's going to ruin the painting. And more importantly, I'm going to get arrested because <laughs> they're going to tackle me for touching this painting. Amen. <laughs> But when we're in the fat palace of Versailles, it was very interesting because when you think of a kingdom, you think of when you go into the palace, like as soon as you enter into the palace, that, that you just get to see the king. Oh, my goodness. There's a whole bunch of rooms before you get to see the king. There's a whole court when you walk into the palace there's a whole court the throne room is in a different room you're not hearing me guys and there's many different facets of the king because there is this room this courtroom this this hallway where the dancing would take place but then you would have to go through another hall to get through get to the throne room But after you went through the throne room, there was a deeper, more intimate place with the king. And that was a game room alongside the throne room. Y'all not hearing me. Then after the game room, there was another room. Then after that room, it was the king's bedchamber. Now, his most intense decisions didn't happen in the throne room. They happened in his bedchamber. What I'm showing you is to get access to the king is very difficult because you would have to come to the hall for months before the king recognized you. And if he liked you, he would invite you to his throne room. And if, he, and if that went well, then he would invite you to, and it would be a smaller crowd. Each stage to the king was a smaller crowd and a smaller room. And so then he would go to the game room, and then he would spend time there, and he would would select a few out of that on who he would want to meet that would finally go to his bedchamber where he would have his most intimate conversations with people, with with his counselors, because they didn't want anybody to hear. That was the most intimate place, but you, that, that process could take over a year to get to that intimate face to face interaction. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords allows people that are addicts, oh my goodness, people that are just cut off and strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, people that have the most messed up backgrounds, murderers and and all types of people. He allows him to have face-to-face interaction. We have access to the king he doesn't put you through six rooms of probation before you get to see him face to face come on somebody he gives you free access because of the sacrifice of calvary 
Amen. Watch this. So we have access by faith. If you want access to him, you want that face-to-face, -face, it's by faith. Go, let's go back to it, access. All three occasions of prosagoge means an interactive access. It means God's talking to you and you're talking to him. Wow. Refer to having an audience, direct access with God. You don't have to confess all your sins to a man before you're forgiven Amen. by God. Come on, you have direct access. You can say, God, I ask you to forgive me. And... <laughs> Woo! Listen to this. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Now, because I'm in right standing with God, I'm able to glory in tribulations. I don't have to think tribulation is an assault on my relationship with God. I can go through hell knowing me and God are good. Oh, my is that powerful? Because when we're going through it, what, what do we do? We'd be like, oh, I must have did something. I must have did something. I must have did something. That's not always true. That's not always true. Let, let's go to the Greek word for glory, for, uh, for um, boasting. We glory. He says we glory. We boast. We boast in our tribulations. Look what it means. Coxome. Uh, living with head up high, listen to this, boasting from a particular vantage point by having the right base of operation to deal successfully with a matter. So you, your vantage point, why I can boast is my vantage point is I got peace with God. So now I have the right base of operation to deal successfully with any matter. I can lose everything and still glory in tribulation because me and him are good. Amen. And my fall, my failure is not a reflection of me and his standing. Look, look what it says. What holds the head up high, up front, figuratively, it refers to living with God-given confidence. Well, you got blood on your face, and how's you and God? Man, we good around here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't feel bad? You don't feel bad with what you've been through? No. I glory in tribulation. I glory in the hell. Because me and God are good. I got a peace. I'm coming from a different vantage point. You see, if my vantage point was my sin, then I would just cry and feel like, woe is me, woe is me. But if my vantage point is I got peace with him, then no matter what comes my way, no matter what and no matter what hell comes my way, as long as me and him are good, then I'm good. I'm not going to question the blood because I'm in a storm right now. I'm not going to question Calvary because I'm going through hell right now. I'm not going to question his sacrifice or the authenticity of it because I'm in hell right now. I've got peace with God and that's my vantage point. So hell, you can fight me with all the tribulation that you want. I'm still going to walk with my head up high saying God is good. He is great and greatly to be praised. When I'm going through it, I'm not putting my head down saying, woe is me. My head is held up high. And I talk to you about posture. What they talk to me about, the chiropractors and those that have a doctorate in those fields. They told me that posture matters. That when you put your head down, the chin goes to, towards the chest. And they said, what happens is, is it triggers something in your mind that makes you focus on self over everything else. They said, and when you put your 
your chin down there it triggers depression it triggers anxiety and it triggers selfishness when you got your head down like that but when you say said when you put your head up it, it releases the right hormones in your body where there's a confidence that comes in that's why he said hold your head up high I'm not confident because of anything that's in my flesh my head's held up high because I'm lifting up my head because redemption draws nigh I'm lifting up my gaze to the heavens because my strength is not in me it's in him amen 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 I've got peace with God that that reason I'm able to boast a glory in tribulations now let's look at this word tribulations the ellipsis it literally means pressure pressure what constricts or rubs together used of a narrow place that hymns someone in my lord Tribulation, especially internal pressure, and that's what it's focusing on. This is focusing on internal pressure. When this Greek word is used for tribulation, it's focused on internal pressure. But when you look at this, uh, this Greek word, that one focuses on the external pressure exerted by circumstances. So this tribulation, it doesn't deal with external circumstances. It's dealing with what the external circumstances are creating an internal pressure. That's what tribulation is. It is constricting me. It is making, it is internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined. That is restricted without options. It is being compressed. Carries the challenge of coping with the internal pressure of tribulation. Especially when feeling there is no way of escape. Has anybody here ever been in a circumstance where you had no way of escape? Where you have been hemmed in? Where you have been confined? Where you have tried? every option and nothing's working but he said I've learned that when I feel like I have no way of escape I've learned to start glorifying God in the middle of it I've learned to start praising God in the middle of it because I'm walking with my head held high I may be hemmed in but as long as I reach for his hymn I'm good I'm preaching right now when you're hemmed in, reach for the hymn. When you're hemmed in, reach for the hymn. Come on, when you have no other options, he's saying you have direct access. Isn't that what happens, what tribulation does? It makes you, you start looking for all your outs. You start calling your friend, can you help me, can you help me? No, no, I can't help you. Hey, can you help me, can you? No, no. Family, can you help me? No, no. And you're hemmed in, and you look to the job, okay, can you help me? No, no. Everybody's saying no, and so you got, you're forced to look up. Oh my. And when I look up, and I'm constrained, and I have the internal pressure of dealing with the anxiety and the fear of how I'm going to pay these bills and the fear of how my daughter is going to get through this circumstance and the fear of dealing with how my husband or my wife is going to deal with this. When I'm hemmed in, I've learned to glory in that place when I'm hemmed in because he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life and when I can't find a way, he is the way. He's the way. I found out in tribulation that he's the door. I found out when I'm hemmed in, I'm so thankful I can call on Jesus and he just becomes a door. He becomes my way out. He's my way out and my way in. He's my way out of trouble and he's my way into blessing. He's my way out of hell and he's my way into heaven. He's my way out of pain and he's my way into power. Come on somebody. He's my way out of hurt and he's my way into healing. So when I'm hemmed in, I'm just going to call on Jesus and he just becomes a door he will open up a door he will open up a door What, what did David say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For that I got my head up high. For thou, I got my head up high. For thou art with me. And as long as you're with me, I got a door into the table. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. As long as he's with me, no matter how dark the valley 
valley is, no matter how much hell I'm dealing with, as long as he's with me, at any moment, there's a table nearby. At any moment, I say, Jesus, a door opens. I got a table in the presence of my enemies. Oh, somebody clap your hands if you're thankful for a table. Somebody lift up your voice if you're thankful for a table. He's the door. I said, he's the door. He's the doorway. He's the pathway. He's the highway. He's any way that you need, he's going to be that way. He's so much your way, he said, you can call me Yahweh. Whatever way you need, that's what I will be for you. If you need a way out of addiction, just call on my name. If you need a way out of trouble, just call on my name. If you need a way out of debt, just call on my name. So I can glory in tribulation. Why? I got peace with God. I got direct access. It's like going through hell, carrying a door with you. <laughs> so hell's got me hemmed in. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, not him. Every time hell thinks he's got you cornered. I know a name. I got peace with God. I got direct access. I don't need to call an armor bearer. I don't need to call a committee to get to him. I don't need to go through the process of talking to 16 people before I get an answer. I got direct access to the king. My goodness. And whatever the king is, that's peace with God. Everybody say peace with God. You have peace with God. You can have peace with God while living in conflict. See, some people allow conflict to rob the peace. And through conflict, they question their standing with God. Jeremiah said it this way. He said, he said my, from my mother's womb, I, was a, I have been a man. I was born as a man of contention said, no matter what I do, nobody wants to get along with me. <laughs> I keep preaching the word. I keep telling them that, that they're going to be captive. And nobody wants to hear the word of the Lord. And he said, and I just want to shut up. I don't want to preach no more. Because the more I preach, the more they hate me. This is Jeremiah's words. The more I talk, the more they hate me. So he said, Lord. I ain't speaking your words no more. But then he said, but his word was like fire. Shut up in my bones. I got to say something. I got to say, come on, I got to say something. I got to say something. So, so through tribulation, we glory in tribulation. When I'm constricted internally, anybody ever dealt with internal pressure? And the internal pressure, they have looked at internal pressure like when someone, like a breakup happens. Say someone breaks your heart. They, they have studied what the message that is sent to the brain when, when there is internal pressure, an emotional break. They have studied it and they said the body and the, the mind responds the same way to a heartbreak that it does breaking a bone. A physical body, hurting your physical body is the same that you feel with heartbreak. That's how the head interprets it. Where internal pressure starts affecting how you walk. You ever been under so much pressure you walking like this? I have. Nothing was wrong with my body, but I'm limping. I'm being dead serious. The, uh, how's your knees? Oh, my knees are good. My heart's another story. Oh, my. My, my body's good. I've got good health. I'm taking my vitamin C. I got my multivitamin. Need to do better with the multivitamin, though. You know, after, after, after you pass 30, you, you're getting into the multivitamin error. <laughs> And I'm still adapting to that. I got to take my multivitamin every day. But the thing is, like, when you fasting, like, 
I ain't taking that multivitamin. That multivitamin will mess you up when you're fasting. Have you throwing up? Just don't do it. I'm, I'm giving somebody some wisdom out there. Somebody in January was considering a fast and still taking your vitamins. I'm going to ask you to take a break. Because <laughs> you will get sick. I'm telling you. <laughs> Amen. I've got peace with God. And because I have peace with God, I can glory even when I'm under internal pressure. Now, it doesn't say that he takes away the tribulation. But he says, you have peace with me, and that is the force. That is the strength. That is the channel in which you're able to handle the tribulation. Just because he doesn't take it away doesn't mean you and him are good. Anybody ever been through sustained tribulation? My God. Listen, listen, I remember, I remember I was like a year maybe a year in ministry, and I heard a preacher preach, and he said that him and his wife had been in a trial for a while. She, she was having a lot of pain, and so she had to take some medicine, and she accidentally got addicted to the medication, and it was a nightmare. And when and so I'm listening to it. I'm like, okay, yeah, but God's gonna deliver. Yeah, but God's gonna deliver. I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the turnaround. He said, after a 17 year trial. I said, my God, 17 years. He said, after a 17 year trial, God helped us and got us through. I was one year in ministry. I was like, my God, this is what I got to look forward to. <laughs> I want to thank God for that preacher. Because my friend, I've been in some five-year-long trials. No let up. No, no, I'm talking about no let up. I'm talking about incessant. I'm talking about hand, like, pray, like every time you try to look up, like it's like something's holding you down. Five-year trials. Now, I've told you all this story when I first got in church. I, t I told people, like, my first three years in church were the worst years of my life. Because God was beating the daylights out of me. I'm telling you, I was in boot camp. He's like, get that out of your heart. Get that out of your heart. Yeah, that's not good. Devil was fighting. Well, you know what's bad? When the devil's fighting and God's not giving me grace or, or pat me on the back, he's like, yeah, you got to get that out of you. I'm getting tag team. But God and the devil, I'm talking, I'm being dead serious. It was the worst years of my life, but it was the best years of my life because it was the, he got the most fruit. He, 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 he did a work in me. He did a work in me so much, I, I wouldn't dare try to walk in pride. You don't understand. I, I'm before God. God, I can't do nothing without you. What taught me that? Ooh, that three-year valley taught me that. The three-year valley taught me that. But that was so, so think about this. So I just told you that's, that's a three-year process God had me in. That's three years. I just told you that, I've, that I have been, I've gone through a five-year tribulation, internal pressure, five years. Five years. My friend, that's, that's over half of my ministry in tribulation. And from the outside looking in, you see me preaching and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, man, he good. <laughs> you know why I look like I'm good? I got peace with God. Amen. I got peace with God. But it's sustained pressure. And you have to understand the sustained pressure. You cannot question the authenticity of you and God's connection. You still have direct access no matter what you're dealing with. He says, I, I rejoice, I glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Let's look at this Greek word, worketh. No, that's patience. There you go. Katakuzarme. 
literally means to work down to the end point, to an exact definite conclusion, bring to decisive finality in conclusion. He says, listen, tribulation is an employee. Patience is the employer of tribulation. Tribulation, you got anybody working on today? Yeah, I got a few people at Bible Center of Orlando. I got a few sales. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I got a few sales. We have a, we're booming at Bible Center of Orlando. We got to keep going to that place. We got... I'm bringing them to you, boss. <laughs> I'm bringing them to you, boss. They'll have a meeting with you in three months. They'll have a meeting with you in seven days. They'll have a meeting with you in six years. I got them, boss. <laughs> Tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation is... is is working to an end point. It's trying to get you into patience. You better stop listening to this Western culture trying to teach you not to pray for patience. You, 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 are, you are increasing and prolonging your tribulation. I don't want patience. I don't want patience. God's like, okay, I guess you're going to stay in tribulation then. Boy, I'm teaching. I'm teaching. Don't, whatever you do, don't, don't pray for patience. And we're going to look at it. The Greek word for patience is literally perseverance. So you don't want to persevere? You're like, uh, what do I got to go through? <laughs> watch this, watch this, watch this. So, so, so tribulation is literally working down to the end point to an exact definite conclusion, bringing to decisive finality in conclusion. So, so the whole reason that the tribulation comes is, is, it is to teach me how to walk with God with patience. See, see, if I can only walk with God if everything's going good, then I do not understand or have an authentic or deep relationship with God. And some people's relationship with God is always this ebb and flow. If things are going good, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If things are going bad, they're like, mm -hmm. then they get bitter at God. Because why? Their relationship with God is always dependent on their circumstance. And so God will allow tribulation to teach you patience. Walk with me when nothing's going right. And you know what? He's watching us. He's watching on how we handle the little stuff. So it worketh. Next, it worketh patience. Let's go to patience. Hobomoni literally means remaining under. My goodness, this is powerful, y'all. Endurance, steadfastness, especially as God enables the believer to remain, endure under the challenges he allots in life. That's what patience is. The ability to remain under the hell, still believing. Wow. Wow remaining under the tribulation has your situation changed no i'm still showing up to church though i'm still lifting up my hands though i'm still praising though i'm still worshiping no nothing has changed in my circumstance but i feel me drawing closer to god i feel me learning how to worship him when i don't feel nothing i'm feeling i'm learning how to worship him when nothing's going right in my life or in my family i've learned hippomony I've learned to settle in. See, some people, when hell comes, they get, they get to running. Yes. And I've seen this happen with people. They go through something, and so they run. As soon as they go, run. They run. Like, like the, the, the moment, a little hell, yep, I'm out. And they run, and they think the change of locations 
changes the hell. No, the hell follows you. I'm running from this hell. <laughs> look, look, hell waiting on you. Come on, buddy. Because it's not about the location. It's about have you learned your lesson? Amen. Oh, my. And that's what happens. Like, the storm follows you. You know, you go somewhere, you know, you're like, you're like, okay, man, I'm leaving this hell. And then you go to that, and you're like, you have this temporary relief. Like, yeah, man, this is the be- Uh-oh. <laughs> Here come this test again. And, I, and you can go from place to place to place to place for 25 years, and that storm just going to follow. Because this is about a spiritual relationship with God. And he's going to make sure you remain under it until you get the character that he wants you to have. Where your praise isn't dependent on what's going on in your life. Your praise, your worship isn't dependent on how, how, how blessed you are, how much money you have, or how much, how much money you don't have. It's not, that's not what it is. It's, it's dependent on, I got peace with God. That is my source. Me and him are good. And he did not hurt me because of this tribulation. He did not hurt me because of this patient season. Me and him are good. What's happening to me doesn't mean he's trying to harm me. If, if he's allowing it to happen to me he's trying to bring something through me who am i preaching to right now if it's happening to me that means he's trying to birth something through me and let me tell you in the holy ghost if i never went through some of the hell that i went through i wouldn't have the anointing that i have i wouldn't have the favor that i have i wouldn't have the touch of god that i have i learned to thank god for the tribulation because you taught me how to remain under the hell and not get come on antsy and moving all around i learned to remain under it until an anointing comes out of this I I learn to stay under it until character comes out of this I learn to stay under it until the glory of God comes out of this I I learn to stay under it until I learn to love like him I I learn to stay under it until I learn how to love and have joy like him I learn to stay under it until I learn how to treat my brother and treat my sister I'm going to stay under this load until something changes changes on the inside of me amen so Bermoni, to remain under the challenges he allots in life and when god enables you ooh, you need god to enable you see just for you to be here is a testimony that means god's enable you enabling you you're getting bitter at god while he's enabling you to stand God, why you ain't changed nothing? He's like, don't you understand you're only here today because I'm enabling you? Perseverance. Patience. That's what it means. Perseverance. Perseverance. There's a funny quote that there's these little things. You know how they have these motivational pictures? It says success knowledge, perseverance. You ever seen those things? Well, someone made one. Someone had the funny idea to make one called demotivators. (laughs) And so one of them, he has a picture of a shipwreck. And it says, (laughs) it says purpose. (laughs) And it says, it could be the one purpose of your life is to be a warning to others. <laughs> and so they had one called Perseverance. And it was a car driving into a long road into a sandstorm. <laughs> and it said, per- Perseverance. Having, to, having the courage to ignore the obvious reasons you should turn back. <laughs> That was funny. That was funny. The the demotivators. But perseverance is having the ability to deal with conflict and still progress. Still overcome. Watch this. We know that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. Let's pull up the word experience. 
dokime. Proof of genuineness. God want to find out if you real. God, I love everybody. Tribulation, do something right now. Then you're in the tribulation. I hate them. Well, you missed it. Patience worketh the end conclusion of patience is experience, which some translations put character. Proof of genuineness, approval through testing. Before God gives you the blessing, he wants to see, can you survive the test? Can you survive the test? Approval through testing, a brand of what is tested and true. You ever seen that video when Elon Musk first brought out his his truck, his cyber truck, and they picked up a rock, and they said, let me tell you, <laughs> this thing can survive anything, any rocks. They threw it at the window, the thing went right through the window. <laughs> you see, it wasn't approved on the market until it went through the testing. Before God releases you into your destiny and releases you into your dream, He's going to make sure you're approved through testing. So he says, don't get bitter when you're getting tested. Get happy. It means you're getting closer to the dream. Boy, I'm helping somebody. Proof of genuineness, authenticity. Is it real? You ever said something to God? You're like, God, I don't need none of this stuff. I just want to worship you. And then somebody steal your stuff. You're like, God, how could you do this to me? <laughs> Hold on, you say you didn't need it. I know, I know, but I was just praising. I, I, was, just, I, was, just, I was just like church praising, Lord. Like, you wasn't supposed to take me serious. I was just doing that like everybody else was saying it. So I said, I say it too. Why are you going to take my words for real? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Why are you going to take my words for real? They, they said it too, and they're getting blessed. <laughs> the authenticity of it. When I, when I came to the Lord and my foundation was unconditional love, and after I went to Minneapolis and, and preached unconditional love and did that, guess what? After I did it, guess what? God had a test ready. He's like, you sure you believe in unconditional love? Yes, Lord, I believe. He's like, oh, God have mercy. How can they do that? These are some evil people. God have mercy. And then I remember what God told me. I was like, well, Lord, I love them. I love them. I'll serve them. I love them. I'll serve them. People literally trying to kill me, harm my family, harm my ministry. I, I, yeah, I'm talking about church folk. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I'm going to love thee. I'm going to love them. I'm, I'm going to love them. I, 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 I'm going to love them. One person was so incessantly trying to destroy me. Family got in. An accident. The first gift he got was from my family. Another person doing whatever he could to try to destroy me. Something happened in their family. The first gift they got was from us. Because no matter how anybody treats me, they will never change my love for them. How can I say that? Because I've been through the test. I went through it already. Isn't it amazing? After you go through a test, other people try to make you retake the test. 
I'm going to see if he's going to love. I've already passed five years ago. Get behind. I ain't retaking this test. I already took it. I passed. I ain't going back to college. <laughs> I got my master's. I'm good. I'm not going to retake because, you know, I don't retake the test. Here's why I don't retake the test. I don't retake the test unless it's at a higher level. I take a new test. That's a higher level. But you're not going to come and be, I want to see if he's going to love me after I try to kill him. It's already done. You're already forgiven. You're already loved. Let's move on. Been through this already. Easy. It's easy. Been through it. That's my... You, that was my associate's degree. <laughs> we're, we're good. I ain't, taking, I ain't going back and take them classes for my associate's degree. Because you know what happened? You try to go retake them tests, guess what? You make a lower grade. <laughs> I ain't messing with that test. I made a 96 the first time, but I started overthinking. Now I got an 88. I started overthinking, was that one right? Was that one wrong? Was that one right? Now I got a 76. Now I'm barely saved. I ain't taking that test. <laughs> Amen? I ain't taking that test. But God, when he puts a mark on you of anointing, he wants to see your genuine commitment to that anointing. Will you survive the testing or will you opt out and say, man, this is too much? Listen, listen, you got to get to the place where you're so invested, no matter how much it is, you can't turn back. You got to learn to burn the ships. They use that story. Many historians are saying that's not a true story. But they use that story on when... Uh, Cortez was about to conquer a region. He, he burned the ships. Because he went to a new territory, he said, listen, I know those ships go home. But we're burning all the ships. We're going to leave on their wood. And the problem is we serve God, but we got a lot of ships out there. Just in case this don't work out. Is this in case I can't find nobody saved? I got about four other options in the world. Why is quiet? Why is quiet? Somebody clap. Somebody clap. Somebody clap. Somebody clap. <laughs> just in case. Just, just, just in case. Just in case nobody like that love God work out. They had a little, a little DMs. Keep them close. See if they say, drop a scripture every now and again. You believe? You believe? <laughs> Somebody clap. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know, it's like, God, I'm just, I'm just giving him some scripture, Lord. I'm just, see, he say he loved the Lord. Okay, we're going to work it out. We're going we're gonna to work on the cussing and, the, and, and the, all the other stuff. We're going to work on that, Lord. But my point is, and that's just a, that's just a, that's a frivolous, that's an embellishment. But if you have been doing that, then the Holy Ghost is <laughs> <I'm, I'm>, okay. <laughs> What I'm saying here, guys, is that when you serve God, you have to burn the ships. It has to be all in. Listen, I'm so invested, I can't go back. I gave everything. Even if I wanted to go back, I couldn't. Even if I wanted, if I said, God, I ain't called no more. I ain't got nothing to go back to. I, I done gave everything to this. My, my knees are old now. I can't go back to basketball. <laughs> I'm done with this preaching stuff. I'm going back to basketball. I got to have two knee braces, two ankle, ankle braces. I'm looking like an accessory. Got elbow braces, knee braces, everything. And God's like, look at this fool. Look at this fool. Boy, you better get back in the ring. Hell, I have you looking crazy trying to go back. People try to go back and they start wearing 
try, trying to put on their old, like, world clothes. Like, they've been out of the world for 20 years. So I'm going back. Let me see if this still fit. <laughs> Look in the mirror. <laughs> hey, come on, somebody. Hey, come on, somebody. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey. And they're like, Look good to me. Look good to me. <laughs> It's like, that, that hasn't fit you. you. You done had three kids. You done had, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You done had three kids. This, this, was, this was before Christ. Don't go back. Don't go back. God's like, please don't go back. Don't, I love you too much to go back. Isn't that the truth? People started pulling out jackets from like, when they was like 15 years old. And they think they're getting revenge on God. I'm getting you back for all this tribulation. And they walk out of their closet like. <laughs> it's just better to stay with God. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I said it's better to just stay with God. Right? Right? Wave a hand if I'm helping somebody. I hope I'm helping somebody here. Just go all in. Don't turn back because of tribulation. You have peace with God. You and him are good. Let's not go back. Let's not go back to being enemies. Because being enemies wasn't as cool as we like to think it was. Right? I want to be on God's good side. Right? Patience works experience. Character and character worketh, works into hope, expectation, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You have to understand what ungodly means. Let's put it up there. Verse 6, look what it means. A civis. Properly. Yeah. Lack of reverence. Without due respect, failing to honor what is sacred. Literally, it is the opposite, the antonym of respecting what is holy. Ungodly means to just disrespect godliness. People get too comfortable with that. And when we get comfortable dishonoring what is holy and sacred, he says that's what you call ungodly. Can I tell you this? This is, the church is something holy. Amen. Right? And so when we start lacking reverence for this gathering, come on somebody, Amen. lacking reverence for someone who Jesus died for, that's what you call living ungodly. I don't like them because they from there. I don't like them because they from there. I don't like them. I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's pause. You're walking in ungodliness. Amen. Somebody clap. Christ died for the ungodly. Those lacking reverence. Wow, what a God. The people that are lacking reverence, trying to harm his church, harm his people. He said, I don't regret it. I died for them. Ooh, and I love them. Amen. Wow. We don't deserve it. We were all there at some time. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Through his death. I am reconciled to God. Through death, I have been reconciled. And through his life, 
I am able to be saved. His death paid the price. His resurrection was how I got justification. Okay. Now watch this. Everybody stand right here. Verse 10. Uh, I'll read verse 11. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have received the atonement. Verse 10. Let's look at the word enemies. Let's look at the word enemies. Ekthros. An enemy. Someone, anyone, you want to know what an enemy is? Someone openly hostile. You ever met somebody that was openly hostile? You ain't going to talk to me like that! Don't let me do this stair game. I'll scare you. I'm dangerous with this stair game. Openly hostile. That's an enemy. Animated by deep-seated hatred. Oh, my. I know some people like that. You ever seen somebody hate you so bad as on their face? Implies irreconcilable hostility. Proceeding out of a personal hatred bent on inflicting harm. That's an enemy. Describes a person resolved to inflict harm. They're resolved to inflict. They made a stance. I'm going to hurt somebody today. Driven by irreconcilable, deep-rooted enmity. You can't please those people. They just have hate in their heart. And he said there were people that were enemies to God, trying to harm God. That's foolish. Trying to harm God, trying to harm what God has ordained. Oh, man, that's a fool. But they said through what he did for us, we have been reconciled. Can somebody clap your hands and thank him for the reconciliation? Come on, clap your hands. Thank you for the blood. Come on, somebody praise him. Thank you. We don't have to be an enemy to you because of what you did for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, somebody just thank him for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. I was in sin and you died for me. I was ungodly and you died for me. I was an enemy to you, but you died for me. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Lord Jesus, bless your people. Bless them, God. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, let the Spirit begin to do a work with them. Let them take this word home. Bless them with the word of God. Let them be changed forever, O Lord. Let them walk in your commandments. Let them walk in the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for all that you did on the cross for us and justifying us. Thank you, God, for the tribulation. Thank you for the patience thank you for the experience and god we thank you for hope we thank you that we have peace with you god bless these amazing people in jesus name i 